This is The Fit Mess, conversations with world-class experts in the fields of mental, physical, and emotional health. In this episode... So even though we might be finding challenges as we align further with who we are and make those strides towards it, for me, there's always been this sense that I would do it anyway because it, that energy of truth still sits within it. Now here are your hosts, Zach and Jeremy. There's a famous scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where in his quest for the Holy Grail, he must make a leap of faith by stepping out onto what turns out to be an invisible bridge to cross a bottomless pit. He clearly has his doubts and knows if he's wrong, it will cost him everything. But if he trusts his faith, the reward will be immeasurable. He takes that first most important step and then the rest of the path becomes clear. That is a great analogy for things that have been happening in my life lately and for Zach as well and for our guest this week. His name is Neil Seligman. He's a leading mindfulness expert and inspirational speaker and founder of The Conscious Professional, a mindfulness resilience and well-being consultancy. And I wanna share these stories because I've been told over and over again how what I've been doing is inspirational and that people that I know wish they could do something similar. In my case, uh, as we've discussed, I recently took that leap of faith by walking away from a 20-year career, selling my house, leaving the city and country where I've lived most of my life, in hopes of carving my own path and creating a better life for my kids. Zach, I know you often said during this process that you wished you could do something similar, at least as it relates to your job. I, I have been much more detailed offline, of course, but yes, yeah, much I, more detailed offline. I've been wanting to take that leap of faith for a little while now. And in the experimentation, like manifesting money and stuff like that, I was like, oh, this, this might not be bullshit, but I have wanted to for quite some time now, and I inadvertently did. It was planned, yet not planned. But yeah, I actually actually quit my job a couple of weeks ago, but I had nothing lined up. I didn't have another job. And that, so I that, just, is, that is weird for you. You are very I, much, I need the next 12 steps of whatever I'm doing, especially if it's something big. I need to know where those steps are, how hard to take them, and where they're going to end up. Yeah. And this was, I will say just this much, like this particular situation, my work environment went from pretty good to one of the most toxic environments I've ever been in, Mm -hmm. in a six month period. So like it just risk or not, I just couldn't be there anymore. Yeah. As we're talking right now, like tomorrow is my last day. I put my notice in didn't have anything lined up. I'd been like putting some feelers out to see if I could find something and um, just making the decision of quitting Mm -hmm. was really all I needed. Yeah. So like find that next thing. And then I've been reading Joe Dispenza a little bit too. And and I just, I followed the instructions in the book. I took out a piece of paper and I wrote down what I wanted for a job, what my intentions were, what the emotions were, and just represented with a, a letter. So I put my notice in two weeks ago, and as of two days ago, I've just signed an offer letter, and I have a new job that I'm going to that is, like, much better. Like, all across the board is a much better job. So can't thank the universe enough for making me take that step. And now I've got this awesome job that I'm going to that I'm really looking forward to. Just bounds better. Like, just money's great. The position is great. Everything is great about it. And I'm just so happy because I had to take that leap of faith. Well, and that's, I just, I keep seeing that scene that I referenced in the beginning from Indiana Jones. Like he's, if you, if you remember the movie, it was 1989. So some of you may not have been alive. I don't know. He's standing between these two points and there's just a huge bottomless pit between him and where he's trying to go. And he sees no clear path how to get there. And he references a book that points out all you need to do is just walk across. And so he's just sitting there going, this, this is nuts. I'm going to die. If I take one step forward, I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. But I have to trust that perhaps something bigger is at work here. And he does. Mm-hmm. He lifts his foot, steps out, and lands. And then all of a sudden, he takes the next step. And it's just it's that watching that scene is so powerful when you put it in this context. Because that first step is agonizing. He's sweating. He's just agonizing over how in the world am I going to do this? And by the third step, he's like gleefully almost jogging across to the end result, which is is Mm -hmm. what he's, what he's chasing. And that is just so analogous to what you've experienced so far, what I've experienced in my move. I've never been happier when I walk my dogs, when I go around the neighborhood, when I take my kids to the pool, 
I'm constantly saying to myself, I've never been happier. I can't yeah. believe how lucky I am to be where I am. And I agonized for almost a year about, oh my God, am I really going to, how am I going to do this is crazy. And it is so interesting. Just taking that step mm -hmm. just made everything, it made the bridge appear and it made it so much easier to just keep taking steps and going faster and pursuing the thing that we're here to pursue. And we, I share these stories. We share these stories in hopes that it inspires you. If there's something that, that you've been wanting to do for years and feel like you're not ready or feel like you're not the guy to do that thing that, that you've always wanted to do, or you're not the woman who would be so brave as to do that thing, you got to do it. If, if yeah. there's that thing that you know you're supposed to do and you're afraid to do it, I hope that these are stories that, that inspire you to do them, to at least try because yeah. You're all, I say this to my kids all the time. You're going to regret the things you didn't do way more th than the things you did and failed at. Yeah, but do it responsibly. I'm, it worked out for me, but I, I will never recommend to anyone quitting their job before they have the next one lined up because that space in between was pretty terrible. Like the, and granted it was very short, Yeah, but it was and it's not like I, I don't have to worry about money, but like just the thought of being unemployed was so terrible <laughs> for me. That that may say more, a little bit more about your anxiety issues than than the, the circumstance itself. Yes, but do it smartly, right? Yeah. Like we're not all going to be in that Indiana Jones situation, but don't just step off the cliff right. where there's obviously you're going to fall and die. Be careful. Do things responsibly. Make sure you've got a plan in place. But definitely take that step. And if you don't have a plan in place, that is the step. That is the leap of faith is to start making that plan to, to do that thing that you've been putting off doing or, or are otherwise afraid to do. But if our stories aren't enough to inspire you to make that change, perhaps our guest's story will. His name is Neil Seligman. He is a leading mindfulness expert and inspirational speaker. He's the founder of The Conscious Professional, a mindfulness, resilience, and well-being consultancy. He did very much the same thing a few years ago, took a huge leap of faith, walked away from a very uh, prestigious career to chase his dreams. And I hope you'll find his story as inspiring as I did. Let's start with your story. I think that's a very inspiring one, especially right now. I'm having so many conversations with people in all kinds of backgrounds that because of this last year and a half, they have reevaluated everything. They want to try something new. They're shaking things up. And so I want to hear your story and use it as a guidepost for someone who's considering taking a big leap of faith and trying something new. So walk us through the big shift that happened in your life. Yeah, yeah definitely. So I um, was practicing as a barrister, which is a trial lawyer, essentially. So over here in the UK, we still have that kind of wigs and gowns nonsense. And so that was my job. And he was in court every day, fighting the good fight for clients. And it's obviously being quite a hard job to get into. And I put a lot of years into training. And then I had a chance conversation in the car park after work about eight years in. And yeah, a friend of mine from bar school, we trained together, bound up to me. I hadn't seen him for a while. He said, hey, Neil, how's it going? I hear you're one of the rising stars of the civil bar, which nobody had ever said to me before. But what I heard in my head when he said that was, your star is rising in the wrong field. You have to leave. <laughs> Wow. And, uh, yeah. And that little line of words came in with such a kind of vibration of truth that I really could do nothing other than listen to it. And so I decided to leave. So I wrapped up my practice. It took about five months and uh, completely stepped away from my career, knowing that it was over, but not knowing what was yet to, to come. And sometimes people say, oh, well, that's either they say it's crazy or it's courageous. But actually in my experience, it was just true. It just was like that, that landed with me. It was true and everything changed from that moment. So that's just awe inspiring. That's such an amazing step that you took. I'd love to hear how long did it take before something materialized or something started to come together where you said to yourself, I think stepping away was right and now I'm okay. But how long did that take and, and how did that happen? It's a really interesting, quite nuanced question because it felt so true from the moment it happened. 
it did feel right. Like it consistently felt, that's not to say that it wasn't hard. There's some steps like initially I had told my chambers, which is where it works, it's not a business, but you share an address and reputation and stuff. I told them that I was going to take a sabbatical. I was just like, just in case I just go right. terribly wrong. <laughs> but actually five months into having stepped away, I had this compulsion to resign. I just had to cut the cord and essentially quit. So even though the time wasn't up for this sabbatical, I resigned from Chambers. I had to let go of that vine before I could swing on to the next one. But to answer your question, I fully stepped away in 2009 after wrap things up. And 2012 was when I had the idea for my business. So that's wow. three years later. Wow. So how, one, I can hear myself and the audience going, how did you not starve and die for three years? And then tell us what it is that you're doing now, what path this set you on once you walked away from that career. Yeah. So yeah, now I run a, I run Conscious Profession, which literally landed in a meditation, the logo with the name and with that I was going to be teaching mindfulness as the primary goal of it. And so that all landed in 2012, but well, luckily, so I was still practicing as a barrister. I'd done a few days of teaching for a company and there was like a relationship between this company and, and my chambers. And so I said to them, look, I'm free now. I can do a few more days. And so that became a kind of a bread and butter for me. There was also really good luck in, in the UK as a barrister. The client doesn't have to pay you. <laughs> Probably shouldn't say that. Like, there's a like gentleman's <laughs> agreement that the solicitors will pay you for your work but they quite often take years to pay you. So I think I was still getting checks through the post from the work I'd done as a lawyer. Oh, wow. Um, for several years onwards. And they tended to come just when I needed them. Like when I was like <laughs> bankrupt, go close to it. Like, oh, <laughs> and then this little kind of gift from the universe would arrive in the post. Oh, phew. Yeah. So anyway, so that's, a bit of teaching work. I was doing some private speech sharing meditation. I'd been doing some Reiki stuff. Even when I was a barrister, I'd been offering Reiki sessions and teaching Reiki. So I did a bit of that, but it was very hand to mouth at that time. And yeah, I'm not sure how that worked. Like when I coach people through transitions, this is not the methodology. <laughs> it's not just go without any thought or planning. Yeah. So this is something we can think about a bit before we do it and yeah. maybe put things in place. But no, I, I don't know. It didn't happen to me. So this is inspiring. And I, as I mentioned before we started recording, I'm going through something similar. Our audience is probably sick of hearing me talk about this and wanting me to get this over with. Literally, I'm four days away as of the recording of this interview. I'm four days away from walking away from the job that I've had for 14 years. My right. family is not only moving, we're moving to another country. We're moving up north to Canada and we have no jobs lined up. We have not a lot to, not a lot that we're moving for. We are selling our house and we're just going to live off of that while we figure things out. And it is funny when I share this idea with people, it's the same thing. Oh, that's courageous or that's crazy or how brave, how exciting they runs the gamut. But most people I think are, are surprised because that's not what we're taught to do. Like right. culturally, we are taught, get a good job, buy the house, settle down, stability, slow and steady. So how just a personal therapy session here for one, but for anybody who's also considering making this leap, where do you start? How do you make sure that this is the right thing? How big of a risk is too risky? How do you do this without just completely going nuts? Yeah. The words that really held me through that time of kind of WTF were leap and the net will appear. So leap and the net will appear. And the teaching that sort of sits behind leap and the net will appear is that something emerges from nothing. Okay. So in the nature of the universe, something emerges from nothing. In fact, there's sort of two sides of the same coin. And yet the world doesn't really get that or know that. The, the world lives on something emerges from something. Yeah. So something from something, people could put the pieces of something and something together and be like, okay, this adds to this or whatever. But something from nothing is a deeper kind of spiritual truth. And so what we're entering into is a spaciousness, which allows a host more possibility to emerge through you. And then the practice as you're doing that is finding the things 
that allow you to center yourself outside of fear-based thinking so that you can listen and, and witness and see what is emerging and be the, the shepherd of it, cultivate it, and also to respect the rhythm of it. You know, there's many times along that three years where I still didn't have the idea yet where I could have turned back or given up or whatever, but I did have a sense that it was still emerging. That I actually never lost faith that I had done the right thing and it was the right path, but it does have its own rhythm. So we've probably hinted at it a little bit, but what sort of challenges would someone expect to face? We, we talked about just support from loved ones and the financial fears. What, as you coach someone through this, what do you prepare them for to make sure that they're able to get through those ups and downs? Yeah, I think it's really important for people to have a couple of people that are super on board with it with you. So in my situation, my boyfriend at the time was hugely supportive of this change. And I'd previously been in a relationship where my partner was threatened by the change and was very much, no, he was a, a dancer. It's very much like, you keep the steady job and this is our safety. And so I've got this kind of more up and down type of work. So it would have been harder for me to actually do that transformation with that partner. But my partner at the time was completely on board, was really helpful at just guiding me through it. And the other principal person, so I think you only need maybe two, <laughs> three would be nice, but like you got two champions working with you. The other was my teacher. So she's like a meditation teacher, but she's also like a coach and mentor to me. And I'd met her about six months, I think, before I had that insight. So I was really fortunate to have almost like a parenting figure who could also hold not just me, but also the idea of my business in her awareness and to shepherd me through the process of what I describe as living from listening is really trusting those internal nudges, insights and impulses and to trust it so much that you listen and hear what actually is right for you. And if when we can do this, what emerges is something that is aligned with our being, that it has this sort of, it's almost like integrity on steroids. I think there's another word that's, that was like tensegrity, which is like a matrix of integrity. So I don't quite get it. I think it's an architectural term or something, but it, I like the idea of it's really, it has angles, it has structure, it has support. And so what emerges actually has a life of its own, which is really cool. And then you're the channel of what's emerging through you and you're participating with it and it feels fun and purposeful and authentically you, because it is you. It's kind of, this is what we're meant to do as human beings, let our unique voices and gifts and offerings come forward rather than all kind of shepherd our consciousness into the same box and then wonder why we can't solve our problems. Yeah, yeah. I think what you're saying makes sense to me because I've felt it myself. Whenever fear creeps in and, oh, this is a huge mistake. We should just stick with what we've got. We've got it pretty good. We don't take a big risk. Don't take a chance. That feels wrong. I, I can just internally feel it. But I guess for someone who is maybe earlier in this process or still thinking it through, how do you differentiate between the voices? The one that's saying, yes, this is the path. Quit hanging on to everything. How do you differentiate between the fear and the, the intuition that's calling you to something better. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Yeah. yeah. Those kind of inner voices. For me, the inner voice of wisdom or insight has a different tenor and vibration than the voice of fear and anxiety. And that's something that through meditation, I come to know it's but like, you know, in the external world, you have your circle of friends and then by their voices and their faces and you get to know people. But we also have this kind of inner relationship with thought streams, voices. Sometimes they're characterized by people that we know, maybe our guardians or parents or whatever. Teachers sometimes appear and, you know, sort of slave driver or inner critic might have some of this. Or some people have like a council of inner critics <laughs> where they've got like all these different voices like pinging in. We do get to know them. And I think for fear thought that we don't know the difference between the two is a bit of a story. It's actually one of the ways that we don't listen to the inner voice of wisdom. Because most people know what it's saying. They're just looking for 1200 reasons not to listen to it. And I know because I 
done that. Yeah, yeah. In lots of situations, I've not listened. And yeah, it's the giving yourself permission to know when you know. Yeah. Um, allowing it to be a bit messy because it's human. And there are tricky bits that come along with any sort of transition and change. If we're learning, if we're laughing, if we're loving, those are all good signs that we're moving mm. in the right direction. And ultimately, if who you are, as we will get to know ourselves more deeply over time, as we do that process, if we're not aligning who we are more with our thinking and activities and behaviors and jobs and missions and all the rest that we love to get involved with, then it does produce a tension of its own, right? It produces its own sort of dislocation from what feels very deep and true and meaningful and important. Mm -hmm. So even though we might be finding challenges as we align further with who we are and make those strides towards it, for me, there's always been this sense that I would do it anyway because it, that energy of truth still sits within it. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed uh, as I do battle the voices of fear and, and optimism, one of the places where I found some grounding is looking at my past. And some of the most memorable life-changing experiences I've had came from taking a big chance and, and not listening to the fear and just trusting that things were going to work out. And when I try to think of the things where I allowed fear to prevent me from doing something, it's harder to, to even recall them. It's like they don't even exist as much. So have you experienced, have you looked back at your life and gone, wow, even before I left that job, these were, these big moments happened when I just trusted that things were going to work out the way they were supposed to. Yeah. I think I was a bit of a dreamy kid and always a bit sort of destiny led. And if you ask my parents, I'm quite impulsive and that sort of a person. But even when I was a barrister and practicing law, it didn't feel wrong. But I did have an underlying sense that it wouldn't be the thing for me. I actually even talked about before I got into it, that it was my plan B <laughs> and that plan A would come along. And I, I don't know why I was saying that, but in my mind, I was like, oh yeah, because I'm like going to be a movie star or right. wrapped up by some glamorous sort of dream job. Let's be honest. It was the wigs. You just wanted to get out of the wigs. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty much <laughs> hot actually, so... Yeah, it's good to let that go. Very cool. But if you want to keep going with your line of questions, Jeremy, he's, I've got a couple of questions, but Jeremy is living through this kind of right now. So <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I want to, I'm looking at myself maybe six, seven years ago, and I've had a lot of experiences over the last five years of trusting, I, I call it trusting my gut, my intuition, the feeling, that, that voice that you're talking about and listening to it. And some of the biggest mistakes I've ever made was going against that voice today the universe provides when I ask for it, 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 it just shows up. And I, it's been so relieving for me to not have to worry about all of these things and things just work out the way they're supposed to. But six, seven years ago, and I'm asking this question from that perspective, six, seven years ago, I would have said, wait a minute, this all sounds hokey. This doesn't sound real. You got to show me some evidence. And how could this possibly be? How do you answer those people who are like, wait, whoa, whoa, this sounds way out in left field. This is too woo woo. How do you respond to people like that who haven't had the experience or not open to it in any way, shape or form? And have you had success in convincing people to try it and it works out? Yeah, I, I don't really try to convince that mindset, actually, because I really respect the fact that we come to philosophies and ideas and tools of living when we're ready. And I think going against that or kind of full speeding your own philosophy, what might work for you and other similar kind of stories that might have inspired you and the type of books that are on my bookshelf, like this is my world. And it is something that I've been pursuing and learning about for, you know, over 20 years. And it's something that has led me forward. But if tracked back through that journey, there's been all sorts of different manifestations of who I am as a person and what I was ready for. So if someone is saying it's to this or to that, I try and respect that because it's not for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Not everyone should immediately quit their job and go and meditate until they figure out <laughs> what they're really meant to do. That is not the prescription. There's a deep impulse that rises up in the body and soul when someone is ready to make a transition. And at a certain point, that impulse gets so loud 
that it's almost easier to go along with it and to fight it anymore. And for me, yeah, it crystallized in that moment, but it didn't come from nowhere. I had that narrative that there was something else going to come along that was holding that in my consciousness somewhere. I had this interest in Reiki and meditation that came through from my teens. And I'd even had a little side business for a while whilst I was still practicing. It wasn't like a complete turnaround. There was Mm. some stuff there that was, it was like another track of my life happening side by side in my legal career. And it just so happened that at a certain point, it's like, this is what's happening. And I suppose I also have to acknowledge I was in a privileged enough position to listen to that. Because it doesn't take just courage and a good meditation practice. It also takes a bit of a network, maybe a bit of a foundation financially, it takes a lot. And not everybody has that. And it's very much, I think, important to respect people where they are. I find it fruitless to convince people. When I was, when I was a student, I probably shouldn't say this, but I used to get drunk and do Reiki on people when I was drunk. Oh, that, that's a business model right there. Drunk Reiki sessions. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and the purpose was to convince them that it was real. I'd be like, can you feel the energy shooting out of my head? <laughs> anyway, I, I was that guy. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. Not my vibe anymore, but yeah, it's something I think that we all there's a rhythm to it. So I think yeah. that's worth respecting that. You mentioned meditation. Obviously, it's a big part of what you're doing now. It's the foundation for everything that has happened to me in the last eight years on my journey to, to better wellness and, and all that. It's obviously a great place to get quiet and listen for that voice that tells you what you're supposed to do. What else can people do to open up to what their intuition is trying to tell them? Are there a couple of places you tell someone to start when they're like, I just, I'm stuck and I don't know how to find a way forward? Yeah. So I think most people, when they're feeling like that, they're also very busy in mentally and invite people to find a bit of space and it doesn't have to be meditation, but it might be just like take a bit of time in nature every week, hang out in the woods, stroll through the parks, go running, take up something where it takes you out of yourself a little bit, because we do need a bit of a different brain dynamic to listen to something other than the fear brain, the shopping list and the to-do list. You know, and for a lot of people, that's pretty dominant in, in their minds. Inviting a bit more space in, if they can, gifting themselves the permission to do stuff that they find joyful. Try and reconnect people back to practices that they maybe had as they were kids or creative practices or music, whatever, things that used to really make them feel alive. And maybe for whatever reason, they've let go and just inviting them back into those, those processes that actually help us to transmit and express emotional energy, which when we couple that with a busy brain, we often get all sorts of tangles going on. So it's really about finding space and just giving them a bit of a scent of their joy, their creativity, the kind of things that, you know, because we, we don't all come into the world born terrified and you know reclusive. We come in wanting to try everything and getting into everything and curious and delighted and then terrified and then scared and you know, crying and then tantrum. You know, we, we have everything. And sometimes we get a bit dulled down by the weight of just being an adult and all of the stuff of life. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a good place to start. And if not meditation. I try and get most people to have a bit of a practice yeah. for working with me. So. It's a fabulous place to start. Speaking of working with you, where do we learn more about you? Where do we acquire your services? Yeah, so a good place to start is neilsaligman.com and that leads you into the, the various different worlds. Then in 10 is my new online course, uh, which is 10-day mindfulness challenge, which leaves you able to meditate for 10 minutes without your phone. That's that's on there as well. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in the corporate stuff, it'll also lead you to the conscious professional, which is, which is my business. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and your insight on this. Inspiring and uh, helping me through my own journey. So thank you so much for being available. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, guys. That was Neil Seligman. You can learn more about him at his website, neilseligman.com, or just go to our website, thefitmess.com, and look in the show notes. You can find all of the necessary links there. So our thanks to him for talking with us. One of the things that that I didn't mention earlier in all of our going on and on about Indiana Jones and how awesome that movie was, after he crossed the bridge, there's an important scene that is just really quick, but it never really hit me until getting ready for this conversation. 
when he crosses the bridge, he grabs a handful of sand and throws it back across the bridge to show how he got there. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a throwaway. Oh, he's just making sure that when he gets back, he knows how to get across. But there's, I think there's a deeper metaphor there. And I think that the idea of looking back when you've taken those leaps of faith and seeing that they worked and seeing it as evidence that you can do hard things, that you can do scary things and take big risks and seeing how you got where you are, I think is, is critical to this journey and critical to any uh, path that takes you into some scary and dark places. And so I just, I think that's an important thing, whether it's through, if, if you keep a journal, whatever you do to track your progress on whatever goal you're working on, it's always important to look back and see how you got where you are, because it's easy to get lost and to forget the growth that you've already accomplished to get where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Just even in my little bit of taking a leap and having it magically work out just at this moment in time, looking back at it, I mean, it's only been three weeks maybe, but like those three weeks and looking at the steps I took and looking at the decisions I made and going, wow, that like that reflection was really important because next time I'm in a situation like that, hopefully I'm never in that specific situation, <laughs> but like yeah. next time I'm in a situation where I need to take that leap, I can look back and go, okay, this is how you did it here. And it's just really helpful. I do want to clarify one thing. I think a couple of shows ago, I mentioned that I was eating potato chips at 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah. So that was actually the stress. I had quit my job and then found myself eating potato chips at 10 <laughs> o'clock in the morning. But you know what else I had that morning? What I had happen? an athletic brewing beer that morning and many cents. They have <laughs> actually, they got me through those couple of weeks that were really stressful for me. Again, there's no alcohol in it, but like just grabbing one and enjoying it. Like it was psychosomatic but it really just brought me down i enjoyed it it relaxed me and then i was able to go out and pump out a few more resumes or do another interview and i, I actually didn't feel but i actually did an interview while i was drinking one out of the can they couldn't yeah like they couldn't you know really see the can because my right. hand was covering it okay it looked like a seltzer but i was sure. drinking a beer in the middle of an interview that's uh, awesome in the middle of a zoom interview there there's great there is a weird psychological hole that seems to fill i've mentioned as well just that there are times when i feel like oh god i just when normally i would turn to beer to relieve some stress i can now turn to that one guilt-free and know that it's actually not only alcohol free, but relatively healthy for me. So can't recommend yeah. them enough. You can learn more about them on our website, thefitmess.com. Head over there and subscribe to the show on whatever podcast player you're using and sign up for the newsletter so you never miss an episode. Our thanks again to our guest, Neil Seligman. Links to him and his services are on the show notes for this episode. And our thanks to you for listening. Thanks so much for being there. We will be back next Wednesday with a brand new episode at thefitmess.com. See you, everyone. We know this podcast is amazing and doesn't seem to lack anything, but we need a legal disclaimer. Prior to implementing anything discussed in this podcast, it is your responsibility to conduct your own research and consult your physician. You should assume that Jeremy and Zach don't know what they're talking about, and they're not liable for any physical or emotional issues that occur directly or indirectly from listening to this podcast.